Hi, I'm Cathy Speed. I'm a consultant in rheumatology, sport and exercise medicine. And my particular interest is the holistic management of musculoskeletal injuries. And the concept of this evening was to talk about interventions in the form of primarily injections, but I'm going to talk about the wider scope of some of the typical uh, medications we use in sports injuries to try to give a few <coughs> what I hope will be simple messages. Um, and actually, we're here to talk this evening because there are so many different therapies um, from a non-surgical perspective that we use in musculoskeletal injuries that it can get pretty confusing. And um, I'm going to try to cover rather uh, rapidly um, quite a few different types of interventions that we might typically use in the uh, sports injury clinic. Um, and uh, I think that essentially one of the most important things that we recognize is that there's, there's a lot of confusion. There is a huge amount of um, debate about when to use different interventions and why. One of the reasons that we get confused and we have so much debate in musculoskeletal injuries in terms of um, non-surgical in interventions is that if I was a cardiologist and I was giving you a lectures on best interventions, we would only cover um, these areas here from uh, good, large, randomized controlled trials and right up to the pinnacle of systematic reviews uh, of ev the evidence base. And we're not very good at doing that in, um, in musculoskeletal complaints. One of the problems is that once we've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Once we use an intervention for one condition, we think it translates to every other musculoskeletal conditions uh, that, we, that we might treat. And, and I think we would all recognize that that's false optimism. If we take the example of a, uh, an Achilles tendon, we know that patients will differ depending upon on the type of tendon injury they have, the presence or absence of neovascularization, the grade of tendinopathy they might have, is the problem at the insertion or is it at the mid portion, et cetera, et cetera. So translating evidence base from one injury to another, we have to accept is not necessarily a straightforward intellectual process. And so this lovely um, pyramid of evidence-based medicine actually escapes us somewhat in terms of uh, discussing best interventions and arguing the case for different interventions. And so when we talk about evidence-based medicine in musculoskeletal practice, this is much more of a realistic framework. So we take our experience, we work together to discuss um, different interventions that we're using, we take the particular characteristics of the patient, we take the best evidence that we can, and we pool it to try to improve outcome for that one individual patient. And that's essentially what's often different about musculoskeletal practice. So I'm going to cover some of these um, pills and potions. And if we look, to look at all of these um, interventions, and um, both Jason and uh, Andy are going to discuss more about injection therapies, um, actually, we have to stop and think, what are we aiming to achieve uh, with these types of uh, interventions? So the aims, well, we might think we need to pain manage to facilitate rehabilitation. Uh, maybe we might think we might modify the disease process. Um, people talk about regeneration. Everyone loves the word regenerative um, in, in musculoskeletal practice. And obviously, we hope to optimize uh, function Effectively, if we look at the list of things that I have put up there and I'm going to discuss, we're really treating things with anti-inflammatory approaches. If you look at the characteristics of many of the typical medications that we have to our, um, to our hands now in musculoskeletal practice, most of them are working primarily on the concept of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is a good thing. So the natural process of uh, tissue inflammation should not be interfered with unless we really have to. So when should we intervene? If inflammation is excessive, meaning if it limits the early phase of rehabilitation, or if it is excessive in terms of the fact that it's continuing on past um, seven days or so, if it's limiting the full assessment of the condition, those are the things that actually are the limited criteria upon which we base um, our decision making to intervene in relation to inflammation. And these are the anti-inflammatory agents that typically people would talk about in musculoskeletal practice. Non-steroidal agents, topical trial meal, uh, corticosteroid, viscous supplement and trial meal zeal injections are the typical agents in sports medicine practice right now that we might reach for. 
and people talk about anti-inflammatory properties of PRP. And I'm going to mention PRP towards the end and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what really cell therapies means um, predominantly just as a passing few comments. And this is the format upon which we would usually use these agents. We'd stop with, start with topical agents. If they don't work, we move on to oral, non-steroidal agents. If they don't work, we move on to injections. Now, in terms of risk-benefit, that, that approach isn't necessarily the right way around, as you'll see in a few slides. But actually, from a practical accessibility approach, it's probably the easiest um, framework to base our thoughts on. So as far as non-steroidal agents, do they work in musculoskeletal pain or not? Across the board, non-steroidal agents, either topical and oral, have good efficacy in pain management. Anything that's on the left side of this line, these are all different studies of different sizes in topical non-steroidal agents in, um, uh, in uh, musculoskeletal injuries. The evidence is strongly in the favor of them working. And the same applies to oral anti-inflammatory agents they're all pretty effective in managing uh, acute and chronic musculoskeletal pain. If you look at topical non-steroidal agents, it's actually pretty impressive how those agents get into even cartilage and meniscus uh, in terms of uh, regular application. So they get to the tissue. They may not work as effectively as oral non-steroidal agents in some people, probably because of central effects of oral non-steroidal agents. But if you're trying to treat local inflammation with a topical agent, you are just as likely to get that agent to the tissue in question through a topical agent um, than you will do through an oral agent. So eff effectively, they should be the first line of approach in injury. What's the downside of these, these agents? And in particular, what's the downside of using oral agents? Well, you're all familiar with these. And when I have patients who get really stuck on non steroidal agents, I just say, well, that's OK. But they typically will, can kill more patients than some cancers can. And that can change practice fairly quickly if patients are pretty reliant on the non steroidal agents orally. There's another element that we're all pretty familiar with in sports medicine, which is what about the effects on the tissue healing of non-steroidal agents? And there are several studies now that indicate they inhibit soft tissue repair, particularly muscle, muscle regeneration, and they cause a weakening of the emphasis with um, uh, prolonged use. So essentially, that does make you rethink how quickly you would want to intervene with non-steroidal agents. So when should we use these agents? Topically or, if really necessarily, orally, only in acute inflammation if it's excessive, if the patient is in severe pain, if the symptoms are not responding to anti-inflammatory agents over the course of 10 days, then the, the, the medication should not be continued and other approaches should be sought. And as I've said, avoid in, um, uh, in muscle injuries, and I haven't, I haven't got time to go into why we should avoid them in bone stress injuries, but effectively they do inhibit bone repair. So limit, limit our use of non steroidal agents but you, and use them as safely and as effectively as possible. Now, what about acute injuries? What else can we, uh, can we use? Uh, anyone who's familiar with trial meal, this is used a lot across the world, South America and Europe. Uh, topical trial meal gel, this is a randomized controlled uh, trial which effectively compared diclofenac with, um, with trial meal and, and topical diclofenac is well proven in acute ankle sprain. Trial meal seems to have similar effects. Pluses or minuses, maybe less adverse effects with topical trial meal. Um, so it, there is evidence for, um, for its use in acute soft tissue injury. So those are the topical agents and I've talked about oral agents and what about getting into the main topic of injections. Corticosteroid injections, it's pretty simple to talk about their anti-inflammatory actions, but actually these agents have been around for 70 years and we still don't quite know how steroid injections work. They clearly don't just work on inflammation. They clearly have other um, uh, mechanisms by which they uh, control pain. Do they work in musculoskeletal injuries? Yes, in that they provide pain relief. Uh, and they will do in most musculoskeletal injuries. That's not to say we should use them, it's to say they will provide pain relief. Their relief, though, is short, and most well-designed randomized control studies would actually suggest that steroid injections would give three to six weeks of benefit. Now, that might reassure us that that means that most of the time the steroid isn't lingering around that will cause lots of potential adverse effects, 
but effectively we should remember that we are only facilita facilitating pain management for six weeks. If that saves six weeks of oral non steroidal agents, maybe that's worth it, and I'll discuss that uh, shortly. So the evidence for benefit of corticosteroid injections in acute uh, complaints is um, in bursitis, such as this calcific tendonitis, and is in um, tenosynovitis, so long flexor tendons, extensor tendons with a tendon sheaths. Um, we know that there are times when we would not and should not use corticosteroids, and that's when there is evidence of significant underlying tendinopathy. So again, we, when we talk about do steroids work in tendons, yes, should we use them in some? And in those that have evidence of an inflammatory process, which is predominantly the, um, the tendon sheath problems, um, and in the absence of significant underlying tendinosis that would predispose uh, the patient to rupture. And this is the point. When we're looking at a lot of these agents, it's the risk-benefit ratio that we're measuring up. Not do they work, but what's the risk of using them? So um, again, judicious use of steroid injections in those patients who do not have the risk factors that would make us worry about using them. If we look at corticosteroid injections and other injections in osteoarthritis, um, again, I've talked to you about risk benefits. So purple is risk and gray is benefit. And if you compare steroids with non-steroidal agents, actually the, the risk benefit ratio is in the favor of steroids. Similarly, just moving on to um, viscous supplement injections, a similar um, risk ratio to corticosteroids, probably not as bad as non-steroidal use, um, not quite as effective as steroids. Now in clinical practice, what we actually do is we often combine steroids with viscous supplement. And this is on this theory that steroids have a peak of action of sort of three to five weeks and start to wear off. Viscous supplements typically don't start to work until often up to five weeks, depending upon what agent you're using. So you're trying to combine these agents to give a prolonged effect of, of an uh, intra-articular therapy um, that may actually give long-lasting relief. The problem is, much as this is common in clinical practice, so it's that bit of the evidence-based medicine profile that we should be considering, there are no randomized controlled trials that actually combine these agents. And that's because the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in um, in promoting the combination. Moving on to Traumiel and Zeal injections, I've, inc I've included this slide because it's a really nice recent study that compared placebo with Traumiel Zeal intra-articular injection in patients with knee osteoarthritis. And there was significant benefit of the com combination of TZ uh, over placebo. Why is that useful? Because we're trying to avoid the uh, side effects of corticosteroid, which specifically include infection and tissue atrophy. More studies like this need to be done, but it's interesting when we're trying to find other intra-articular agents. So I've talked through this type of a um, process of choosing agents depending upon the situation, but I would urge you to consider that actually sometimes, if accessible, injection therapies might be a wiser choice for some patients rather than prolonged non steroidal use. Now, what about other approaches? I think it's worthwhile talking about um, high volume injections, and you're familiar with this, which is that where uh, we inject between the, uh, the fat pad and the, and the tendon to try to get rid of these new vessels, um, performed in patella tendons and Achilles tendons, but look at the level of evidence base that we're basing all these injections on. There's a very low level of evidence that supports their use, and so albeit that they, they show promise, the publications out there aren't there to, to defend us when we choose to use these types of approaches. What else? Well, in, in insertional tendinopathies, as a rheumatologist, um, I think we miss a lot of individuals who may respond to biologic agents. These agents are extremely effective at high level of, of evidence in patients with um, insertional enthesitis. That's those subset of people who've got an inflammatory type of insertional tendinopathy. And anyone heard of GTN patches in tendinopathy? So these are used um, quite commonly in the management of tendon complaints. They were developed really on the very simplistic thought of increased blood flow must increase um, uh, a tendon uh, physiology, uh, the health of the tendon. That's not actually probably true. Um, it, they probably uh, reduce pain in tendinopathies because of um, at nitric oxide um, activity. 
but the level of evidence is reasonably good. Randomized controlled trials, that's the type of uh, evidence base that we want to depend on. We use bone agents in, in um, bone injuries, and I don't have time to spend much time on this, but they act both in an anti-inflammatory way and, and on the bone itself. And we will use these in uh, recalcitrant stress fractures, and we'll use these in recalcitrant osteitis pubis to try to modify uh, the bone me remodeling that's going on. And these really are, are reserved for um, uh, recalcitrant cases. Now, very lastly and very quickly, cell therapies. This is a, 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 a figure of how rapidly publications in, in terms of growth factors and stem cells are in uh, musculoskeletal injuries over the recent years. And just shows how much the hype is, because most of these publications are nothing to do with uh, strict randomized controlled trials. They're commentary, commentaries, they're case studies, um, they're not very well designed research. And PRP is the most hyped up of the um, things that we use in sports medicine at the moment on the basis of the whole good old word regeneration and on the basis of the use of growth factors in these types of um, conditions. The problem is that there are an awful lot of other potentially pro-inflammatory um, cytokines and proteins that may actually aggravate the condition, not um, cure it. So the message on PRP is that although we can show some randomized controlled trials that looks at um, uh, benefit, um, there are many randomized controlled trials that do not show benefit in tendinopathies. And actually, if you look at the correlation between the quality of a trial and the result, the better design the trial, the more likely the result is negative. Um, and that's what we need to really face with PRPs. And lastly, a mention about cell therapies and tendon pathologies, because if people talk about this, they, we are a million miles away from getting there. If you look at animal models of mesenchymal stem cells and tendon healing, wonderful results, absolutely fantastic. That's brilliant. But the problem is, A, they use them incredibly early in the injury, and we don't see patients, or I don't see patients that quickly. Um, and we certainly wouldn't be running around with stem cells if we did. Um, and so we have huge challenges to meet in tendinopathies. And if our, in our working lifetime we get there with some form of cell therapy, and I could show you similar slides for joint injuries, uh, then we'll be hugely successful. But it, we need to focus on the so-called simple things that I spent most of the time talking about. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jason Harvey. I'm a consultant spinal surgeon. I have a specialist interest in cervical surgery, including disc replacement surgery, and also um, treat lots of patients with lumbar spine problems performing simple and complex procedures. My talk is really going to be about how I use uh, injection therapy of the cervical spine uh, to help with my clinical practice. So in thinking about the cervical spine, I think about the symptoms being neck pain, radicular symptoms or uh, myelopathy with cord compression. So the aim of the practice really is to try and avoid surgery. So try and do as little as possible if we can and treat patients without surgery. And likewise, when a patient has multiple level problems within the cervical spine, what we want to try and avoid is multiple level surgery, which on occasion needs to be done. If you look at what happens with um, disc pathology, and this is probably one of the best studies there is, looking at the natural history I looked at 560 patients. The first thing to note is there's quite a different set of patients. So we're talking about a symptom really of cervical radiculopathy rather than a diagnosis. And we have patients with soft disc protrusions or significant spondylitic changes. And so how they respond to treatment may be quite variable. With respect to what causes that pain, well, there certainly is physical compression of the nerve. I say there's a pressure effect, and there's probably some ischemic effect. But there's also some biochemical sensitizers which are released, things such as interleukin-1 or prostaglandins. And that probably goes some way to explaining why we look at um, scans, and there may be very large discs and relatively uh, minimal symptoms and again we can have quite small disc prolapses and 
significantly large symptoms. The diagnosis can be quite easy with radiculopathy if it follows the normal patterns with symptoms um, showing normal der dermatomal patterns, normal myotomal patterns, but that isn't always the case. And there's an awful lot of crossover because there is a lot of connections between those various uh, nerve roots. And so clinically, it can be very difficult to decide which actually is the level which is causing the problems. Or in fact, if it is a truly ridiculous problem with nerve compression or whether it's a referred pain. This is a nice study that looked at symptoms around um, the scapula region related to ridiculous symptoms. So preoperatively, they mapped out the pain around the scapular region, they had a decompression for their ridiculous symptoms, and the symptoms went away. And you can see that there's an, a map relating to the different uh, nerve roots causing that pain around the scapular region. But then you can compare it with this diagram on the left. This is facet joint pain mapped out. This is our ridiculous symptoms. And you can see that it can be very difficult to decide whether we're talking about ridiculous symptoms or whether we're talking about neck pain symptoms referred around the scapula region. And also there's an awful lot of other diagnoses, peripheral nerve dysfunction, thoracic outlet syndrome, shoulder pathology, and then even rarer but also significant diagnoses which can be difficult to decide whether that's actually the cause of the symptoms which we may think are neck pain or ridiculous symptoms. So if there's a C2 compression, patient may present with neck pain and pain radiating over the posterior act aspects of the scalp. A ridiculous symptom at C3-4 with its dermatomes over the neck may present purely with just neck pain. And I've operated on these patients, decompressed the nerve roots, and their neck pain has gone afterwards because it's ridiculous symptoms. Likewise, pain in a C5 distribution which will be over the deltoid region, can be very difficult to differentiate from shoulder pain, problems such as rotator cuff, impingement, or frozen shoulder. Again, C6 radicular symptoms. As we saw before, they may have this periscapular pain. They may mimic carpal tunnel uh, compression due to the median nerve compression. And there may be the so-called double crush syndrome. So you have compression at the wrist, compression at the neck, compounding their symptoms. In the C7 nerve root, again, referred neck pain and pain very similar to a carpal tunnel compression. And with C8 going over the ulnar border, it may mimic an ulnar nerve entrapment, either at the elbow or in Guillaume's canal at the wrist. And also, um, what we see is potentially thoracic outlet syndrome. We see several of these a year where patients come in with radicular type symptoms but actually what they've got is thoracic outlet syndrome and when you ask them carefully what they really don't like doing is lifting their hands above their head. They say there's certain things that they just can't do. I find the best test for that, this rouge test, you put your arms up like this and do this and they've got true thoracic outlet syndrome. Within 30 seconds they will really want to put their arms down. It's very, very uncomfortable for them. So it can be a bit of a di diagnostic dilemma here. Uh, history and examination can help us, but there's an awful lot of pitfalls. Correlating their symptoms with radiological findings again can be helpful, but injection therapy may be useful in helping us to try and sort out whether this is a neck problem, a cervical problem, or another sort of problem, and also if it's a neck problem, whether it's a ridiculous symptom or a referred pain from degenerative changes within the neck. As Cathy's already said, the evidence is very limited, but the rationale to use it is diagnostic, find out the cause of the problem, find out the level within the neck, and also as a therapeutic treatment. So the injections that I use within my practice are a selective nerve root block, injections into the facet joint for neck pain, medial branch blocks which may be therapeutic but also may lead on to the decision to perform um, 
radio frequency ablation and more uh, a longer term solution for neck pain. So the aim of a selective nerve root block is to firstly therapeutic, also diagnostic and we're trying to localise one particular nerve root which we think is causing the symptoms. So we're going to aim into this neural foramen around the nerve and inject around the nerve root sheath. Now ideally I like to do this procedure under local anaesthetic because you get quite a lot of feedback from the patient. I also think it's safer. So they're in the supine position. We take an x-ray uh, in the lateral position first of all to find the level at which we're going to inject. We then do an oblique picture. See here, so we can see the neural foramen nicely and aim the needle to the back of the neural foramen. And the reason for that is that we're putting the needle behind the exiting nerve root and behind the vertebral artery. So that's a safer position to put the needle in. And once we're in position that we think is appropriate, inject dye which flows up around the pedicle there. And once we've ascertained that that's in the right position, the local anaesthetic and steroid can be injected. Now, what is the evidence for that? Well, as I said, it's not fantastic, but there is some evidence to support it. There's a study of 60 patients, CT-guided injections, and they found they had a significant reduction in pain following the procedure, and that those patients who had foraminal disc herniation had the better outcome. So they did actually try and differentiate between the different types of pathology, um, which I think is very important with this. Uh, further study, retrospectic, retrospective study, really looking at whether patients had to go on to go um, for surgical intervention. And the majority avoided surgery, 19 patients required surgery. Failing of that, of course, is the natural history of this. The vast majority of people are going to get better anyway. So it's difficult to know whether that intervention actually made a difference as to whether they would have had surgery or not. But it's what I use in my practice for that reason, to try and avoid surgery. And again, this study looking at evaluation of levels. So to try and guide us if we do think we are, or if we end up performing surgery, which is the right level to operate and limit the number of levels within the neck that we're going to operate on because that is beneficial to the patient long term. So 30 patients and they found it was useful in deciding surgical treatment levels. With respect to cervical facet joint uh, blocks, I use these both as a diagnostic and a therapeutic decision making process. So if I'm unsure that they've got ridiculous symptoms or whether it's actually referred pain for the neck, I'm trying to avoid surgery. So if I, I perform the facet joint injections and we get improvement, it suggests it's not a ridiculous symptom and I don't operate for axial neck pain. I do operate for ridiculous symptoms, so again, it may help me to avoid that. And the evidence here, this is a review article um, looking at it, and they came to the conclusion that cervical facet blocks, the evidence is fair at best. Medial branch blocks, um, what we're doing is aiming our treatment at this uh, medial branch as it comes off the exiting nerve root, and this is supplying the facet joint, and this can either be an injection of local anaesthetic or local anaesthetic and steroid. And again, the evidence for this um, from these review articles is that it is fair from uh, this review article. Grade two evidence, which is not bad really for injection therapy articles. And here, looking at comparing local anaesthetic with local anaesthetic and steroid, there was a better outcome with local anaesthetic and steroid. If we're considering a more long-term, not permanent, but not more long-term uh, relief of the neck pain, then facet joint ablation may be appropriate. And here, the needle again is placed around the medial branch here, but um, this is then, um, a current is passed through here to um, ablate the nerve with time, these nerves grow back, so it's not a permanent process. And again, um, review articles for a long-term improvement in pain, the indication is fair. With respect to complications, 
You can't enter into these things without considering them. These are rare, but can be serious. They're still less than in surgical intervention, but I can send my pa patients for uh, a significant number of uh, different complications. So there's a risk of infection. This is a case report on a patient who presented several days after their injection with an epidural abscess and cord compression. Likewise, um, hematomas. The vast majority are extradural, but this is actually uh, an intradural hematoma uh, where they had to open up the cord and evacuate the hematoma. And then um, neural damage. I don't know if this shows up that well, but this is following injection therapy. And if we look at that middle scan there, there is some quite significant signal change within the cord which is probably ischemic in origin. And uh, injections of local anesthetic and steroid can cause cord damage and even brain infarct because they enter the intravascular supply. So if you then look at this scan, what we're seeing is the part of the procedure of a nerve root block where the dye has been injected. You see quite nicely that the dye is going into the nerve root sheath and going up exactly how we want it to. However, if you look there, those tiny little lines, that is suggesting that there is also an intravascular flow of the dye. And so we inject this local anesthetic and steroid, it potentially is going to go intravascularly and that can cause the problems which we uh, have seen with the neural damage in the cord or the brainstem. With respect to the future, well, people are trying to do different things. This is a study that came out, it's a pilot study really, it came out in September um, and is looking at um, what they termed autologous condition serum. So it's prepared from the patient's own serum um, and what it's doing is concentrating these uh, antagonists to the interleukin-1 receptors. So this was what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the inflammatory um, mediators and this within our, within our serum blocks that. So what they were trying to do was concentrate this down and then inject it instead of local anesthetic and steroid. They did a prospective randomized trial with respect to this, looking at the neck disability index, uh, the neck pain disability score, and a visual analog pain score. Now for all these parameters, both in the group that had our um, um, trial, the ACS, uh, compared with the methylprednisolone, there was a decrease in all of those parameters. That said, the methylprednisolone showed a decrease earlier on, but didn't show such a sustained decrease in those scores. So that suggests that um, this may have a more long-term effect compared with the steroids. And as Kathy touched upon it, probably that effect from the steroid is short term and gives us a window of opportunity to treat patients or accelerates the natural history, this possibly will give us a more long term uh, solution to it. So what do I think about injections? I think they're useful, they help us with our primary diagnosis, um, but we have to be aware of anatomical variations which may make our, uh, our diagnosis difficult. The aim of the use of them really is to try and elicit where there is a simple problem which is also happening or a different diagnosis which will allow us to treat the patient more simply. So if we think they've got a double crush syndrome, they need their carpal tunnel decompressed first before we start doing any injections or anything around the neck. If we think there's a shoulder problem, either as the primary cause or a secondary cause, it may be more appropriate to do, treat that area first of all, but our injections may help us confirm that before proceeding to any form of surgery. And I think the biggest thing for me is it either helps me avoid or limits the extent of surgery. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andy Roach. I'm a consultant foot and ankle orthopaedic surgeon here at the Fortis Clinic. I also work in Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. I have a special interest in looking after sports injuries in particular in athletes.
So I want to talk about the reasons for an injection, uh, why, why I feel an injection can be useful and what patients I will use it in. Um, possibly we'll, we'll talk a little bit very briefly about the substances that I use. Kathy covered this quite nicely with different, type, different types of, um, of formulas of, of things. Um, hopefully what we're going to talk about is some evidence base, but also my experience base as well. And uh, we'll discuss a few contentious or controversial injections. So you may think that some of these injections aren't, but I think when you look at the evidence, they really are. And we're, we're going to look at the Achilles tendon and also, and also the plantar fascia. You know, we, we can talk at, afterwards about injections for ankle arthritis or osteochondral lesions or ankle impingement, but um, a lot of those, I feel, are, are fairly you know, clear-cut. We know that uh, patients who have got anterior ankle impingement from an inflammatory cause do well from a steroid injection, whereas sometimes these ones are less clear. So why do I inject the foot and ankle? Well, quite clearly, I want to help the patients. I want to give them a therapeutic effect. Now, that can be in the short term, where you might have a patient who, who might be awaiting a, a surgical procedure. So commonly, you know, a, a gentleman who's, who's got a severe ankle arthritis, who might be listed for three or four months down the line, he might ask for an ankle injection because he's had them before, and he knows it's going to benefit him, but he just doesn't want to have them on a recurrent basis. Um, patients who are wanting to do something, you know, for a short-term gain. So I had a, a lady recently who had a Morton's uroma. She didn't want to have surgery, but she wanted to be able to walk up the aisle in her shoes. So she had an injection. Or patients who are, who are playing professional sport or, you know, even amateur sport. They want to get through a season where they know they can play, probably get through till the end of the season, and then at the break, they may want to have something surgical done about their, about their condition. Obviously, long-term gains, you know, quite clearly we want to maintain the pain control long-term. Again, the one that springs to mind is the elderly patient with ankle arthritis or, you know, tib post dysfunction and subtalar joint pain. You might want to give them serial injections, you know, sometimes until they're no longer needing serial injections for whatever reason that might be. Um, <laughs> or, or if you've done something that hasn't, that hasn't worked and, and, and you're, really, you're looking for, for uh, an alternative treatment, so sometimes steroid injections and others can help. And quite clearly, we're trying to cure these patients. So why do you inject the foot and ankle? Some of these patients just want injections. You know, I, there's a number of patients who will come into the clinic and they'll, I'll say, hello, my name's Mr. Roach. Can I, can, you know, why are you here? What have you come to see me for? Oh, I want you to give me a PRP injection. First thing they say before they know I know anything about them because they've been told that that's what we will do. So there are patients who, you know, you start off your consultation on the wrong foot because they're expecting the injection. Um, <clears throat> you can give them injections for diagnostic purposes. I think Jason touched on this with his facet joints, you're looking for the cause of the pain and the root of the pain. Patients may have conflicting symptoms and in foot and ankle it's very complicated, very complicated. There's a lot of things there beside each other. Things like the perineal tendons and the posterior ankle. You've all seen these patients who have got posterior lateral ankle pain. You're not sure if it's the perineal tendons or it might be the ankle impingement. It can happen at you know, other parts of the foot and ankle. So every now and then you'll say, well let me send you for an injection of the perineal tendon sheath and see if it gets rid of the pain. Because even on an MRI it's difficult to tell. The other cases where patients have multiple, what I call multiple pain generators. So you have patients with degenerate change in more than one or two joints. Um, and you're really not sure which one is causing the problem. When you look at the, an the anatomy of the hind foot, show part joint and the subtalar joint are really close together. And it can be really difficult to tell, especially if there's a deformity. So sometimes you might want to inject one of the joints purely to see if it helps. If it doesn't help, then you can inject another one to see if that helps. And you can keep going until you find the answer because what I said to these patients is, it's a damn sight safer for me to inject your ankle than it is to do an ankle fusion when it's not going to work. So I do think there's a real place for, for the diagnostic injection. So I suppose when you think about injections, we're all talking about steroids really, aren't we? That's probably, probably the, you know, the theoretical gold standard. But So there's just been, been a good study done in, in the orthopedic foot and ankle literature a few years ago where they just surveyed a number of orthopedic surgeons as to what they're going to be happy injecting steroids into. And quite clearly, very few of them, as uh, you, know, you would be glad to say, don't go near the Achilles tendon. But they may inject the retrocalcaneal bursa. And as you go further down, they're much more likely to inject an arthritic ankle or an arthritic big toe or even a Morton's neuroma because we know that that has probably got significant therapeutic benefit. So there's a number of areas that we can inject and unfortunately we can't talk about all of these today. So what do I use? Well, this is based on uh, research that's looked at the chondrotoxicity or how basically damaging these things are to cartilage. So for intraarticular injections, and I really roll this out to soft tissue as well, you're looking at a lower concentration of marcaine, which is less chondrotoxic than the standard 
and mix it with equal, equal volumes of depomedrone, which has essentially been shown to have a higher solubility than Kenalog, which is the other one that a lot of people will use. Kenalog is useful in, in, in larger joints because apparently it's got, a, it's got a much, well, it's got a lower solubility, but in a larger joint that doesn't matter quite as much. And this becomes um, a safe concentration. And this is, this is what my radiology colleagues would gladly inject if, if I was to send a patient for an injection. So when we're looking at steroids, we obviously patients are, you know, wor well, should be worried about complications, okay? It's the ones that come in and say, I want the injection no matter what. They're the ones I worry about. It's the patients who ask you about the complications. So we, we need to tell them what they are. There's obviously a long list, avascular necrosis, liver disease, you know, there's a whole list of things. But the ones that I see are certainly a steroid flare. And you may have all seen this after somebody's had an injection. Thankfully, it doesn't happen in everybody because it's pretty painful. Um, and it looks like an infection. They, it can go red, it can go hot, it can go swollen and tender and they can't walk. But thankfully it usually settles down quite quickly. Other ones are local tissue atrophy and skin depigmentation. I have seen this and especially in areas around the dorsum of the foot or the anterolateral ankle where there's really no fatty tissue. There's not a huge envelope of tissue to, to, to basically dissipate that steroid. So they can have a local, a local problem. Infection. So this is a lady who had an injection done, um, I'm glad to say somewhere else, but this could happen to anybody, um, and it was for an intermetatarsal bursitis, so very, very benign, innocuous injection. Four weeks later, she looked like this. And, the, well, you know, you would assume there was nothing else in the history. She had a cortisone injection, and that's how it ended up. You know, the, the, the risk of this, when I speak to Jerry Healy and Justin Lee and co, who have done hundreds, if not thousands, of injections, they, you know, they really... Probably it's way less than 1%, you know, way less than 1%, but you need to tell these patients. So she was, for six months of her life, she was struggling to, to get this to heal because the blood supply to that area is not great and the skin's quite thin. So you've got to be very careful when you're doing injections in areas where there's not a huge amount of skin coverage. Would I still do that injection? Of course I would. You just need to warn the patient. So the other thing we sometimes see, and I'd be interested, I don't know if Jason sees this when they, when they do um, reconstructions around the neck, we see a lot of steroid deposition. And this is clearly a patient, this is an Achilles tendon who's had an operation, and it's clearly uh, a patient who's had multiple injections of steroid around it, and it doesn't dissolve very well, it stays there, and it can cause hard lumps on the, on the tendon, and it probably doesn't affect the tendon itself a lot, but what it does do is it means that I have to cut all these areas away, which leaves you with more damage to the tendon, probably, the, probably more than what the patient needed. So we'll talk a little bit about some contentious um, issues, plantar fasciopathy and Achilles tendon disorders. So plantar fascia injections, I have to say I'm fairly conservative with plantar fascia and the injections. I don't know, some of you may do a lot of injections, but um, I tend to use it whenever other ther therapies have failed or are not progressing as quickly as we would like. And what I mean by that is a, a, you know, physiotherapy, shockwave therapy, gel pads, etc. Sometimes you can do it in the acute setting where the patient has a severe on, you know, sudden onset of plantar fasciitis. And really the theory behind that is you're catching it in the, in the inflammatory phase where they have a lot, a lot going on down there. There's a lot of swelling in the, in the heel pad. Um, so this is a patient who had one of probably the most severe plantar fasciitis I've ever seen. And I was convinced I was going to inject it when I saw him. And he came back a week after having had his MRI and the MRI looked like that. And he told me his pain was better. But on the presentation, he, w he couldn't walk. You know, I had to give him crutches to get out of the clinic. So I think in the acute setting, there, there is an indication for that. What do we do? What do we inject? Steroids, PRP, dextrose, or dry needling. There are loads of other things that are in the literature, alcohol, all sorts of things. But these are probably the ones that we deal with most. So let's start off with steroid injections. There's a lot of studies out there, and as Kathy has already said, the, 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 the methodology and the quality of the literature is very mixed. So you've got to be really careful when you're really drawing, drawing your own conclusions. Um, and this is, this is a paper that was a pretty good paper, randomized controlled trial in the orthopedic literature that essentially looked at joint mobilization techniques and, stero um, uh, and stretches versus steroid. And the, the, the reason I personally like this paper is because what it really drilled home was the concept of joint mobilization for plantar fasciitis and not, not just sticking your foot up against the wall and stretching your heel out, which is what, I, I'm sorry to say, I'm going to our annual conference in three days, that's what everybody thinks works. You just put your foot up against the wall and you stretch it out. But this paper really drilled hold the concept of joint mobilization, which I think works, or certainly helps. But the interesting thing, like Kathy said, the steroids really didn't give you a much greater benefit after 12 months. So for the first six to 12 months, it probably helps, but after 12 months, not a huge amount of benefit. 
And this is reflected in the vast majority of the literature for steroids and plantar fasciitis. Good short-term relief with local anaesthetic, but not a sustained relief with the steroids. We see the complications of the fat pad atrophy, 1.5%. I think that's real. I've seen it before. I think if you have seen it yourselves, it's quite debilitating. Patients don't like it. Nerve injuries, plantar fascia rupture, infection, like the slides before, you know, way less than 1% in my experience. Not, 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 not seen a huge amount. So the holy grail of everything is PRP. Do we do PRP injections for this? Well, when you look at the literature, the literature is definitely mixed. There's papers like this that really show um, significant benefit of PRP over cortisone. So I think if you've got an injection like cortisone, which you don't like to do, and then you have a study that says PRP is probably better than the one that you don't like to do, then you should be more likely to use PRP. Makes sense to me. PRP is very hard to, well, not, it's easy to get. You, you essentially take some blood from the patient, but the machines, etc. not everybody has access to them. But what PRP has done that I think is different from cortisone is it gives the patient a more sustained relief. So this is a paper that was done uh, three or four years ago. It was repeated by Tim Clough, who's uh, a friend of mine up in Manchester. Who basically, he's just a good guy. You think if he's going to do some research, he's well respected, he's going to do it well. And he did do it well, but he, and it, but he came up with a very sort of commonsensical conclusion where he said in chronic cases, PRP produces an efficacy rate approaching two out of every three. So that's not sort of you know, being very optimistic and over-egging PRP. It's just a very honest appraisal and opinion of PRP. So for that reason, it might well be worth trying PRP over cortisone. Dry needling, do you, I don't know if you do dry needling or if you don't, but um, I've seen it done. I don't personally do it, but I've seen it done before. It's, it can be painful for the patient, especially if you take them back three or four times. And there has been some studies that looked at sham versus the real thing. No other injected material. And they showed a very short-term benefit with dry needling at, over, at only 12 weeks. But I couldn't find any long-term studies to support the use of dry needling. What about prolotherapy, dextrose, polydocanol, whatever you want to use. But de high, high concentration dextrose is used as an irritant and to really kick off uh, a healing response. Um, the problem with prolotherapy is you tend to have to repeat it like dry needling if you're going to do it that way every three or four weeks. And there's a lot of studies that will say there's a high dropout weight because the patient has it for three times and they wouldn't come back for the fourth because it's too painful. So you've got to think about that when, you, when you're offering this type of treatment. Does it really work? I don't really think so. I think the literature doesn't really support its use. But again, the quality of the literature isn't great. So when you think about injections, and, you're, and you're, you know, Jason uses image guidance with x-ray for his injections, should we be using ultrasound? Well, when they, when they did one study looking at the, uh, the, the ultrasound's guidance, they found that the complication rate at 12 weeks was exactly the same whether they used in, uh, ultrasound or no ultrasound, as in they didn't have any complications. And it was always my thinking you should use image if you have it. I think for what, if, not, if not anything, it helps the patient, it reassures the patient because they, 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 the radiologist, if they're good, will often show them the pathology. The patient then has an appreciation of what's happening and they have, they have an appreciation of what they have to battle with to get this thing better. So I find, I, I personally send most of mine for ultrasound because we have it freely accessible in the clinic. Okay, let's move on to the Achilles tendon. Again, the Achilles tendon, you have a number of substances that you might want to inject, PRP or blood. And the reason that says PRP stroke blood, there's a huge amount of trials out there that have looked at PRP, and it's always called platelet-rich plasma. But then other studies call it property-rich plasma because nobody knows exactly what concentrations are effective or which of those four-letter growth factors that nobody ever understands are in the, in the thing that's <laughs> going to work. So the, the PRP literature is mixed. So, so with the Achilles tendon, I, I'm glad that Kathy touched on this because you've all, seen, you've all seen many Achilles tendon problems. You have to decide on what intervention you're going to use based on clinical findings, and that sounds very obvious. Because if you say to somebody you're going to do an injection for an Achilles tendon problem, everybody's going to automatically say, oh, they're going to have a high volume injection because that's the only injection you can have for an Achilles tendon problem. But what you have to do is you have to work out if it's an insertional disease or if it's a non-insertional disease. Because quite clearly, if it's a non-insertional disease, you have the parotenone, you have the Kager's fat pad. If it's an insertional disease, you have the insertion onto the calcaneum and the retrocalcaneal bursa. So you're treating different things, and there's different approaches you need to take. If you read an MRI report, they often say there's a split in the tendon. Now, we often get people who say they've torn their Achilles tendon, and quite clearly that's a different thing. A split could be a degenerate longitudinal defect in the tendon that functionally may not be causing anything symptomatic, but on the scan has been picked up as, as a tear or a split. So that, that can um, influence your treatment. Do they have a generalized swollen tendinopathy, the classic 
you know, diffuse Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, because again, that's something totally different from a simple split or a tear. Is it a very superficial pain? Is it an acute pain? Is it a paratendinitis? You know, I'm not going to bang on about the difference between an itis and a, you know, a non-inflammatory condition. That's all sort of done and dusted. But sometimes you can see people with an acute you know, inflammatory disorder of the paratenon, and it can often be very severe. Or is it on the medial side? You hear people talk about plantaris pain. Do you have a very isolated medial pain in the Achilles that isn't a circumferential problem? It hasn't got swelling all around the tendon. So when you look at insertional disease, you clearly have different presentations. The only one that I would advocate treatment with an, in, an injection acutely for is the one on the bottom right, which um, I think in this room design probably doesn't project very well. But essentially what you're looking at is a retrocalcaneal bursitis, an isolated retrocalcaneal bursitis. I think that's something that can be targeted by a steroid injection, always under ultrasound in my opinion. The other ones, you know, the guy on the top right, he's got that massive spur on the back of his heel. You can inject that till the cows come home, but nothing's gonna make that better until that piece of bone goes away. So that, that will need surgery. The one on the left has got a mixture of uh, bony prominence, but also if you look closely, some little bodies in the tendon insertion. So that's probably a degenerate tendon where you don't really wanna be going anywhere near with a needle, and certainly not anywhere near with a needle filled with corticosteroid. So the one that we, that we think about mostly for injection therapy is probably mid-portion um, Achilles tendinopathy. And with PRP, again, we know that the animal models have shown quite nicely that you can reduce the <laughs> neovascularization, improve the disorder, you can improve the, and uh, normalize the, the tendon structure by upregulating collagen one production. Uh, you can throw out loads of pro-inflammatory mediators. So there is a lot of work there that says PRP does this in animals. The problem is in the clinical evidence in human studies, um, even though you've got some very good randomized controlled trials that actually are some of the better ones, and I think what Cathy said is very important, some of the better trials give you better results that probably are negative. And that's really important, I think, in PRP application for Achilles tendinopathy, for mid-portion tendinopathy, because quite frankly, none of the literature has really strongly advocated the use of PRP for your classic mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. We know, however, that in Achilles ruptures, which you, know, you may not think that PRP has an application for Achilles ruptures, but um, there has been some good studies done in, in, in animal models, which you, you know that if you inject PRP onto the repair intraoperatively, you can accelerate the tendon regenerate and it can really improve the strength of that tendon. And there has actually been a recent study published in The Lancet this year um, that did exactly this. They did a, an Achilles tendon repair. They biopsied the tissue. At only, it was only at six weeks, but what they did say was that they had a better type one collagen uh, deposition and improved healing response. It does add some fuel to the fire that PRP probably does have a role to play in the acute, you know, probably inflammatory Achilles rupture, okay? So when you look at the, the sort of clinical trials for that, then you have some trials that were done in two, 2007 that um, did exactly that. They used a, a platelet-rich fibrin matrix. So it's not an injection of PRP. It's an injection of PRP onto this matrix that was made up of VEGF and FGF and all these other ones. And they found that these, these patients got back to sports, running and training a lot quicker, which is probably what we're interested in, because that's what they want to know. They want to know, am I going to get back quicker if I have this type of operation or that? And they found that in the, using this particular uh, PRP matrix, they got back to training and to running significantly quicker than those that didn't have it. The problem is, even, at, even one of the conclusions from this trial, there was no, cons no consensus on the dose or the concentration of the PRP vehicle. Four years later, you look at this trial, another very good randomized control, randomized control trial that looked at what they called autologous platelets. So even people are calling them different names. And what th they didn't see any significant difference at 12 months. So really, there, there, there's two camps of PRP with Achilles ruptures. Do we use it? Yes, we do. Um, we use it personally because I believe it does improve the strength and it does accelerate the healing. And, th and you know, rightly or wrongly, I don't think it does any harm. We have a lot of patients that want us to throw the kitchen sink at them. And I, I do believe that if there is some evidence out there to suggest it works and the patient knows they've had everything done possible, especially the higher level athletes, I think it's a good thing to do. There is evidence there, so it's not like we're just doing it off the bat. Steroids, very quickly, I don't think anybody really uses steroids, certainly in, 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 in this country, very often for the treatment of Achilles tendinopathy. The, the ruptures are definitely anecdotal, but they're there. There is some studies, and even this year there was a study published in our big journal for advocation of the use of steroids in Achilles tendinopathy. 
The problem with most of these studies is they're throwing everything at it with steroids. There's local anesthetic, there's a protonin, there's saline, and really it's very hard to tell what is the effect of each thing individually. We know that intratendinous injection is not really recommended. Where I do find it useful and I do use it is in that sort of very unusual paratendinitis or in that retrocalcaneal bursitis, which is a judgment call. But if you have a patient who you think might have this problem, the important thing is have they got tendinopathic change on the scan? If they don't have any degenerate change on the scan, you're probably more likely to go ahead and use steroid than, than if they did have a tendinopathic change. Prolotherapy, again, I find it useful for the very small localized areas of degeneration. The splits in the tendon that, that we mentioned earlier on, sometimes the radiologist can target that split with an ultrasound-guided probe and inject some prolotherapy, basically irritant, high-concentration dextrose around that. So we do have a protocol in Fortius where the guys will use usually less than five mils of fairly highly concentrated dextrose. High-volume injection, I suppose that's the one that all the patients have heard about, all the patients know about it. And what we're talking about is essentially injecting into Kager's fat pad, which is just in front of the, the, the white arrows in front of the tendon. And you're looking to, to devascularize the, uh, the, the tendon by basically stripping off that neovascularization. You're looking to denervate it because there's a lot of pain receptors that go in from the front of the tendon, and you're looking to take that away. And that doesn't help anybody but the physios, in my opinion. It, it helps you help the patient afterwards, OK? Um, the other thing you're looking to do is essentially just get rid of the adhesions to allow that tendon to glide a bit better. So when you're talking about Achilles tendinopathy in the mid portion, you, you, you can have that sort of long tube of swollen, horrible tendon. Or I'm starting to see more, and probably because it's just being recognized more because of the literature behind this, um, a very sort of isolated medial effect where you think the plantaris tendon might well be causing a problem. We've all heard about it. So the plantaris tendon runs medially along the side of the tendon, and when you look at it intraoperatively, it can be stuck down on the side of the Achilles, and then, you and then theoretically you release it or you cut it away. So if you're trying to do that with an injection, you might think, well, that, well why don't you, it's going to be a lot easier. You're essentially doing the same thing as an operation. Ten sometimes now we tend to actually remove the tendon rather than just strip it off. So the, the plantaris effect can be down to a lot of things. It can be down to the fact that we know the properties of the tendons are different. The plantaris is a much stiffer tendon. So if you have a much stiffer tendon alongside a much more elastic tendon, you're going to get two different complete mechanisms, in, mechanisms and lines of action. Um, we also know that from some of the studies that have been done that you can have anatomical variations where the plantaris tendon can actually be stuck onto the Achilles tendon. Now the problem with these cadaveric studies is they said, oh, this was a new finding um, that in 10% of patients, the plantaris tendon is stuck onto the Achilles. The problem is they didn't have any of the medical history of those patients, and that may well just have been tendinopathy. We don't know. But, you know, it could be from an anatomical variant. MRI scans can definitely show localized changes. And please don't ask me to explain this too much, but we, we, we have started to use hyaluronic acid to essentially act as a lubricant to strip the plantaris off the Achilles tendon in a very localized uh, medial sided disease in the Achilles tendon and there's nothing published about this at all but it's something that that seems to make sense to us and we are using it not in everybody um, it probably has a similar effect to saline but with more of the the biological properties of the sign of the of the sort of the austenal tendon properties that you can find so it's a bit early to tell if this is going to work long term but it's something that we're going to look into in more detail so in summary um, I think the injections in, in plantar fasciitis are often short-lived, um, but what they do is they facilitate an environment to help the physios to allow that patient to recover. I think PRP may well be worth revisiting. Um, I did a sort of straw poll of my colleagues in Fortius about who would, who, would be up to, who would be inclined to use it, and I think two out of five said they would use it. The other three said they were happy just with where they were. So I'm not sure what way we're going to take this, but I, I think there is evidence out there. So as a result, there's no real gold standard injection for plantar fasciopathy. Um, I think in Achilles tendons, I think it's important to, to, to sort of ascertain exactly what the pathology is and really avoid that, you know, that, that high volume. Because patients, they, they, they do, they come in and they say they want a high volume injection because they know about it. Um, and I think you have to avoid that blanket term because the, the presentations vary. I think um, the PRP use in Achilles is probably not useful. I think you can safely tell your patients that it's highly unlikely to work unless they have an acute rupture, in which case then it can be, it can be administered intraoperatively. Thank you very much. Thank you.